So as we think about sermons that shake society, shaking preconceptions, we have here a surprising reply to a sick man's request. We have a shocking truth that Peter reveals in his sermon, and then we've got this astounding, marvellous solution to the problem there. So we're thinking here a surprising reply to a sick man's request. Now I wonder when you last went to a prayer meeting, to a community prayer meeting, to a church prayer meeting, when did you last attend one? Or maybe you've been a Christian a long time and you've come to the conclusion that prayer meetings are not that important anymore. After all that's taken place in the book of Acts thus far, we've seen the Holy Spirit, we've seen Pentecost, we've seen power and signs and wonders and all sorts of exciting things. We might understand if Peter and John had thought prayer is no longer necessary. Let's take a break from prayer meetings. Let's enjoy the moment of uh, Pentecost and all that's gone on over the past few days. But they don't. And here we find them on their way to the temple to pray. Now in Judaism, there's three times that you go to the temple to pray. There's the morning, the afternoon, three o'clock, and the evening. And Peter and John are heading up at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to pray. See, Pentecost and all the events of the past few days have not caused them to abandon their need to pray or their desire to pray. But nothing, nothing could have prepared them for what they were about to encounter on their way up to the temple, except, of course, God. And he had. There's a lame man. He's a regular. He begs at the gate beautiful. And he calls out as they go by, can I have some money? Luke is thorough in his details, and I hope you notice that in the details that he gives us about this beggar. We know lots about this man. So we should be asking the question of the text, why? What's significant? What's important about this man? He's been lame since birth, we know that. He is utterly helpless, his friends bring him. Chapter 4 tells us that he's over 40 years of age, daily begging. There's irony too, isn't there? Here is a man who's far from beautiful, begging at a gate that's called beautiful. One wonders, did he long to go into the temple that he was excluded from because he was unclean? Praying and giving money to the poor was important in Judaism. And devout and pious Jews gave and prayed, believing that that would earn them some much needed merit or favour from God. Forty years of begging have turned this outcast of society into a competent beggar. No one gets past him. And he calls out to Peter and John. And at first, of course, it looks as though they're about to give him some money. But he's quickly disappointed, isn't he? We haven't got any money. But what we do have, we'll give you. What he wants as far as, he can, as far as he's concerned, in fact, what he needs as far as he is concerned, is money. And if you haven't got any money, just carry on, because that's what I need. You're of no help to me if you have no money. Peter agrees. Notice that. I can't help you. But I know a man who can. And Peter turns his attention away from himself and his empty pockets and to Jesus. Look in verses 6 and 7. In the name of Peter and John, get up. No, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Far cry from many out there for publicity stunts today who draw attention to themselves, he takes him by the hand and he raises him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. What he wanted they didn't give him, but what he needed he joyfully received. And the sight of this man, that all this happens so quickly, and the sight of this man clinging to Peter as he arrives into the temple inevitably attracts the people's attention. Verse 10 of our passage of chapter 3, that the regulars recognize him and they're confused. He's walking, he's talking, he's praising God, he's believing. At last he can come into the place that he was excluded from to pray. And nothing, nothing would have kept him out of the temple that day to pray, to praise and rejoice. And the people, verse 11, are just astounded. 
because they cannot explain and they cannot understand what is going on. So Peter and John are faced with a tremendous opportunity, aren't they? To gather some followers for themselves, to take bookings for some healing meetings, to make money in the process, to start a new TV channel, but they don't. They preach about Jesus. And they preach a shocking truth to a stunned crowd in verses 11 to 16. Peter says to this astonished crowd, we have not done anything, verse 12. You see, Spirit-filled people draw attention to Jesus, not themselves. How do you know if someone is spirit-filled? They will draw attention to Jesus. And that's a far cry from our TV evangelists and so-called men who claim to be Christian ministers today. Peter is clear in verse 13. Jesus, who is God's servant, has done this. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. Peter describes Jesus as God's servant. That's a title used in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. This was a title that those listening to Peter would, would, have been fam- would have been familiar with. But not one they would associate the long-awaited Messiah with. He was hardly going to come as a servant, a king, yes, a servant, no. There is no pre-Christian tradition that the Messiah would be a servant and suffer. You see, Peter shakes their whole world view their whole theology, if you like. You you see, the shocking truth here is that the servant of the Lord is the Messiah. And over the page in verses 22 to 24, Peter draws a line from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Jesus. He is God's servant. Peter couldn't be any clearer to these Jews who Jesus is. But then Jesus delivers his threefold bombshell. These are Jews, remember, waiting for the Messiah. They've just been told he's a servant. And then Peter delivers this threefold bombshell in verses 14 and 15. And it is as shocking to the hearers as it would be devastating. You disowned, denied him. We rejected him. You exchanged him for a murderer. And then with devastating precision, Peter comes in and he says, you killed the author of life. Now to the hearers, they are absolutely devastated. They've just been told that the Messiah, the long-awaited one, is coming as a servant. The one you've been looking for and expecting and waiting to come, you've killed him. Disowned him, denied him and rejected him. You claim to know God, but you killed his servant, the author of life, the Messiah the very one you claim to have been waiting for. You delivered him, you denied him, and you killed him, the descendant of Abraham. And he says, we're witnesses to that. How ironic is this, that after years of waiting and watching for him to come when he arrived, you kill the one who has the power to heal a crippled man. It's a different crowd to those in chapter 2 and verse 23, but it's the same message, you killed him. But Peter's sermon has wider implications, doesn't it? It exposes just how sinful and rebellious we are. You see, we're all guilty. We've all contributed to the death of the author of life. In what ways can we be guilty of denying Jesus? When we prefer sin to the Saviour? When we say it's only a small sin, it doesn't matter. Or when we say, well, he'll forgive me anyway. Or he won't mind. Or when we say things like, God doesn't care about me. We're denying Jesus. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 25. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 25 and uh, follow that as I read it. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. You see, when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, we deny him. 
We see this around us every day, of course, don't we? In fact, society is in a mess because of Romans chapter 1, because it has denied him. It has brought lies in and rejected truth. What about us? It's all too easy to point the finger out there, isn't there? And Well, we'd expect society to reject the truth about the gospel. But what about us? How easy it is to be carried along by the clever arguments of society, the lies that come out of academia, the peer pressure to conform, afraid of being a lone voice, and before long we've accepted lies instead of truth and we've denied the author of life. You see, lies allow me to do what I want to do. Lies allow me to live the way I want to live and to believe the things I want to believe even though it's opposed to God's way, even though it's opposed to God's truth. You see, just look at the way the gender debate has invaded not just society, but the church, because too many church ministers, too many churches, and too many so-called Christians are buying into a lie instead of accepting and bowing to the truth, with the result that it has decimated churches, divided churches, And in our own country, in our own land, we have ministers that no longer preach the biblical truth. And whilst we point fingers at others, let's look at ourselves. In what ways are we compromising our faith and denying the author of life? You see, this is bang up to date. Pressure to conform that gradually leads to conforming in lifestyle and we drift away from the truth, we drift away from the church, we drift away from Christians who believe the truth and before long we've just drifted so far. Jesus is exchanged for Barabbas, the murderer. And we who profess to know Jesus deny him by our lives, our choices, our views and our words. Bruce Milne says that Peter confronts his hearers with their overwhelming guilt. You see, no one can be converted until they are first convicted. And I think sometimes that we as Christians, we take sin so lightly, we forget its impact on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be convicted. Not that we need to be converted again, but we need to be convicted so that we come to the cross and say, Lord Jesus... Lord Jesus, forgive me. Well, did Horatius Bono write these words so many years ago? Around the cross, the throng I see that mock the sufferers groan, yet still my voice it seems to be as if I mocked alone. It was I that shed the sacred blood. I nailed him to the tree. I crucified the Christ of God. I joined the mockery. But there's good news. There's good news. Peter continues in verse 15 that although you killed him, God raised him from the dead. And in verse 26, he says again, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. God raised Jesus to life, and the proof of this is that a previously crippled man standing before you today and singing the praises of God. We didn't do it. All hope is not lost. God raised the author of life to life. And because Jesus is alive, this man dancing, standing, praising before you is very much alive. And verse 16 says he is in perfect health. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is alive, and because he is alive, we have hope. Here in the temple, Peter's surprised that these religious people are surprised. They've gone to the temple to pray, claiming to believe in God, and when God acts, they're astounded. How could this be? Why are we so astonished that God could do this? Spurgeon said, if now with eyes defiled and dim we see the signs but see not him... We need to see Jesus. Do people come in here and see evidence for, Jesus, uh, evidence for Jesus but fail to see Jesus? See, we have opportunities to share the gospel, don't we? When people are astonished or perplexed or bemused, seize the day. That's what Peter and John did. 
We want people to see Jesus. What these people see provides an opportunity to tell people about Jesus, not to talk about themselves or work out how the miracle happened or work out what went on. You see, Peter preaches Christ thirdly and presents an astounding solution. An astounding solution. If we look in verses 21 to 26, we see that the people listening to Peter are a privileged people. They know the message of the prophets, they're sons of the prophets, their promised blessings, and the covenant came to them before anyone else. They are privileged people indeed, but totally unaware. In ignorance, he says in verse 17, In ignorance, they crucified Christ. They're responsible for an unspeakable catastrophe and they need to repent. They need to repent. Interesting, isn't it? How how marvelous is this? How astounding is this? That what looks like a catastrophic end makes way for what Chris Wright says is an unimaginable new beginning. I just wonder this evening if you come in here and you think your life is a catastrophe. I wonder if you think your life is coming to a catastrophic end because of something that has happened in your life that no one else knows about. Well, look at the cross that looked like a catastrophic end and yet it opened the way for unimaginable new beginnings. And that can happen with you tonight. You see, in their ignorance, in their ignorance, this is the master plan of God. In their ignorance, they brought about God's purposes for you for me you see in his divine providence and mercy God made provision for your sin before you sinned how marvelous is that look in verse 18 look in verse 18 what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer thus he thus fulfilled. Turn back to chapter 2 and verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And we saw that again this morning. Same word used in Luke 22, 22 that was read to us. It was planned by God. It was a definite plan of God. God planned to do, says Peter, what you schemed to do. And all you need to do is acknowledge your guilt. Acknowledge your rebellion and repent and turn and surrender to him. And here's the really good news. In verse 19, your sins will be blotted out. He'll not be able to see them and he will not be able to judge you for them. Look in verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come. Horatius Boner concludes his hymn, Yet not the less that blood avails to cleanse me from my sin, and not the less that blood prevails to bring me peace within. How marvellous is that good news. The very best news. There were some 5,000 in chapter 4 and verse 4 who heard Peter that day and believed. What about us? What about us? Outside that gate, beautiful, is clear evidence that not all things are beautiful and as they should be. Visible evidence that there is a problem in our world that cannot be cured with money. David Gooding writes, Though all the Christians in the world gave all their cash and worked their knuckles to the bone in the relief of suffering, it could never be the final answer to questions of this kind. No, it couldn't. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let you in. That's why Peter points the crippled man to Jesus. That's why Peter and John point the crowds to Jesus. That's why any preacher points the people he preaches to, to Jesus. My problem isn't sins of ignorance. It's the ones I know about. The words, the thoughts the unwillingness to forgive someone, the grudge, the lack of graciousness, the ease with which I compromise, the times I prefer lies to truth. I need to repent, and so do you. You fill in the blanks. We've all got our weaknesses. Repentance opens the door for each one of us to receive God's forgiveness, the cleansing and the refreshing 
that comes today that guarantees safety and eternal security. Verse 20, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again at that appointed time. You need to repent this evening and receive that refreshing that Jesus offers, promises for those who will. The ancient writing was always written on papyrus and the ink didn't have an acid in it, unlike the inks of today. And to erase the writing, all that was needed was a wet cloth, wipe it away and start all over. It was blotted out. Your sins will be blotted out and start all over. Only when people know what they've done and how guilty they are and are convicted, only when we're aware of the full horror of our sin and the implications, the precariousness of our situation, will we, like the crippled man at the beautiful gate, cry out not to people for physical remedy but for Jesus for permanent redemption. The key to Peter and John being used is their honest appraisal of themselves. We don't have anything. But wait a minute, you say, they've just come through Pentecost, they've got the Holy Spirit, the, the power and all of that stuff that went on. What about all that? Well, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit only reinforces the truth that without God I can do nothing. Jesus' dependence on his Father was second to none, and if he needed that kind of dependence, how much more do you and I? If we're claiming this morning to be Spirit-filled, this evening even, to be Spirit-filled people, Ask yourself, how do others recognize that? Because we can so easily deny the Lord that we claim to follow. The Holy Spirit doesn't reduce our need for God or to go to prayer meetings, to read our Bibles, attend church. No, he intensifies our awareness of our need to pursue Christ, to pray, read our Bibles and point others to Jesus. Only a correct view of ourselves will lead to the conclusion that without God, failure is guaranteed. We need to get it into our heads. I needed to get it into my head, what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, without me you can do nothing. Or do we rely on our privileged position? I come to church, I'm a member of Harper. My family have been in Harper all many years. My family to three generations or more were Christians. I've got all this great knowledge. I've read my Bible 25 times. Go to church. I've got a great education. My national. What do we rely on? It subtly slips in and we think we're privileged. It doesn't matter. We're guilty. And no one other than Jesus can deal with the sin that causes the guilt. And when we repent, he does just that. And as a murderer was exchanged for Jesus who died in his place, so Jesus has died in your place and exchanged your sin for his righteousness that we, the guilty, go free. Bearing sin and scoffing root, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. That's an astonishing solution to a shocking problem for those who will receive what they need rather than what they want. Let's pray together before we sing again. Father, truly we are astonished when we read your word and see that our sin was cleansed and forgiven and the plan was in place before we sinned. Truly this is marvellous in our eyes. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Amen.